Today, we are going to answer part two, letter D is in dog, of your business plan. So what is part two, letter D, of the business plan? I know some of you looked it up already. What is part two, letter D, of the business plan? What are we addressing? Type of ownership. Beautiful. That's exactly what, you said it in like a choir, <laughs> type of ownership. Exactly what I want to address today. Okay, so look. There are basically three words I want to teach you today. Three words. You're like, what? An entire chapter about three words? Kind of, yeah. So the three words are sole proprietorship, partnership, and corporation. Those are the three words we're going to learn today, okay? And each of them has, you know, pieces to it. But the whole point is you guys are going to have to choose the format, the, the legal format of your company, okay? Be it sole proprietorship, be it partnership, or be it corporation. I want to explain to you what each means, and I also want to explain to you the pros and the cons, so you can make a good decision, okay? So, let's start with sole proprietorship, all right? So that's probably the thing that everybody thinks of when they think of small businesses. Now, I want to tell you guys something for exam number two. Ooh, that's the first time I'm saying that, right? Um, so I know that you already know that most businesses in the United States are small businesses. You know that, right? Yes or no? Yeah. I've told you that a bunch of times, right? More people work for small businesses than large corporations in the United States. Okay, you already know that. But what you might not know is that most small businesses in this country are sole proprietorships. And that's kind of a really scary thing. And I'm gonna to explain to you why that's scary. But first of all, let's define what a sole proprietorship is. Single owner who manages the company. Okay, there's a lot more to it than that. But raise your hand if you are gonna be the single owner of your company. Raise your hand. Almost everybody, even if you're not raising your hands, right? Is anybody else going to maybe bring in other owners? That is, that's okay, that too. Too. great, a couple of you, okay? All right, but the majority of you guys are gonna be single owners, yes? You are going to be the majority owner of your company. Okay, so should you be a sole proprietor and the answer is I really, 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 really hope you decide not to be. Okay, so let me explain to you why. A sole proprietor is a single owner of an entity with no legal separation between, between you, your house, your car, your dog, the shoes on your feet, and the business. No legal separation. The business is not a separate, living, breathing, legal entity from you. The business is you. It's you, it's your bank account. It's your house, your car, your dog, the shoes on your feet, okay? So what does that mean? Well, it means that if grandma comes into the business and breaks her face, guess who she's suing? That's you personally. And if the business racks up a bunch of debt that you are then unable to pay, guess who's declaring bankruptcy <coughs> or guess whose credit is being affected, impacted, oh, you personal. Okay, so does this sound like a good idea? No. Well, the answer is it depends, okay? And I'm gonna to explain to you why, why it depends. Okay, so for each of these, sole proprietorship, partnership, corporation, I'm gonna give you pros and cons. Um, you definitely wanna be familiar with the pros and cons, especially for exam number two, all right? Today on the quiz, I'm gonna, maybe there'll be a couple questions about sole proprietorship, partnership, corporation, big picture questions, but for the exam, we really wanna know pros and cons. So let's go over it, okay? So I wanna start with the cons because I personally think that in most cases, sole proprietorship is not always the best idea, all right? So I'll skip around a little bit, but I'll cover all the bullets, I promise. So let's talk, in my opinion, about the biggest disadvantage, which is this one, unlimited liability. What is liability? What is liability? Like you're responsible. Yeah, and by the way, if you own a corporation, you are responsible too, but in a sole proprietorship, what are you responsible for? What are you unlimitedly liable for? Everything that comes, all the uh... Lawsuits and financial repercussions. That is what your unlimited liability contains. So let's think about this. Say it again. If you are um, in a debt situation where your company has accrued more debt than it can sustain, 
That debt is yours. You, the person, you personally, you, okay? And if your company is the uh, subject of a lawsuit, grandma came, came in and for some reason she was hurt by your product, right? Everybody knows the story of like the cup of coffee, the hot coffee that burned that lady at McDonald's oh, yeah. and she sued McDonald's and McDonald's yeah, was yeah. liable, right? <laughs> Customer gets hurt poisoned, damaged, something by your product and service, guess what? They are suing you. You have unlimited liability. Okay, so that alone should hopefully scare you a little bit or a lot, all right? Um, you know, I bring in a dozen cupcakes from my kitchen and sell them to you guys for 50 cents and one of you chokes on them uh, and dies, you're suing me. My house, my car, my dog, the shoes on my feet. My shoes are Dolce & Gabbana today, don't take them away, all right? <laughs> Okay, unlimited liability. The other thing is, sole proprietorships do not have continuity. Let's talk about that word. You're gonna hear that word in the video later. Continuity. What does continuity or to continue mean? Anybody have an idea? So as a sole proprietor, your business does not have continuity. What does that mean? Continuity. Say it again. Okay, yeah. Um, technically one could franchise and we will, that'll be the last thing we talk about today is franchising. Technically as a sole proprietor, one could franchise. Ideas? Okay, so here's the deal. You start a business. The business is a sole proprietorship. Let's say the business is successful and now you want to do something like sell the business because it's successful. You pumped in a lot of energy and blood, sweat and tears and money and value into the company. Guess what you can't do? You can't sell a sole proprietorship. And you might say, well, what the heck does that mean? Like if I start a bakery and my bakery has an oven and furniture and decor and equipment, what do you mean I can't sell those things? Yeah, you can sell the real property. You can sell the stuff inside the business, but the business itself, because it's a sole proprietorship, it's not a separate living, breathing, living entity. You can't sell it. You know what else you can't do? When you die, you can't leave it in a will. You can leave all the physical property you own, sure, but the business itself is not transferable. That's the problem with sole proprietorship. It does not have continuity. You can't sell it. You can't leave it in a will. You can't pass it on. You can't do all of those things, okay? Now, don't be confused. The property that you own, of course, you can do whatever the heck you want with those things. You own those things, okay, if you own them. But you cannot leave it in a will, you cannot sell it because a sole proprietorship is not a separate legal entity from you. Understood? Yes? Okay. Um, here's the other thing, I'll go up to the top. You cannot walk into a bank as a sole proprietor and take out a loan. And you're saying to yourself, oh, you can't. Well, Wait a minute, Mr. Conti, I can walk into a bank and take out a loan. Maybe you already have walked into a bank and taken out a loan. Maybe you've taken out a loan to come to Wade College. I want to ask you, how many of you have taken out a loan to come to Wade College? Don't raise your hands, I don't want to say. It's good. Listen, there's bad debt in this world and there's good debt in this world. You want to hear about bad debt? Bad debt is buying a really fancy car that you can't afford. You take out a big loan for a car and you drive that car off the lot and what happens to that car yeah literally the minute you drive it loses value so there is that bad debt right don't buy cars you can't afford but good debt it's a couple examples of good debt one example of the good debt is a mortgage you want to buy a house right you don't have all the money you need for that house you take out a mortgage on a house but what's going to happen to that house what's going to happen to the house you don't know of course you know, it's gonna appreciate in value, right? Aren't you gonna do beautiful things to that house to make it increase in value? Of course. And the same thing is true with a college education. People who go to college make $2 million more than those who don't. So good debt is if you can't afford to just pay cash for college because you haven't saved for it, um, a college loan is not a bad thing. It's good debt because it's going to appreciate value over time. You know what bad debt is? People who take out college loans and then drop out and can't get jobs. That's bad debt, right? That's bad debt. That's just spending money on a depreciating asset like a luxury car. Anyway, so yes, my point is you can all walk into a bank and take out a loan, no problem, but the business can't. 
banks generally don't lend money to sole proprietorships. They'll lend money to you, the person, but they won't lend money to the business. Why? Because the business is not a separate, living, breathing, legal entity from you. Are you understanding? Okay. So you might be sitting here at this point saying, okay, this all sounds like crap, right? Why the hell are the majority of businesses in this country sole proprietorships? If all of this is true, if they can't borrow money, if they have unlimited liability, if they um, can't be sold or left in a will. Two simple words. And the two simple words that I want to explain to you now are double taxation. Double taxation. Okay? You guys, we live in a country, we live in an economy where we have double taxation. What does that mean? Double taxation. So you probably figure out tax twice. What are we taxing twice? We have double taxation. This is the main reason why people do not not want to be a sole proprietor. They want to remain sole proprietor, even though they risk this and that. What is double taxation? Now on this side of the board. <laughs> so corporations can write off taxes. Sole proprietorships can write off taxes. Like yoga tax and your company will get taxed. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. So if you didn't hear, for the folks at home, if you didn't hear, um, corporations pay tax. How many of you guys work for a company? How many of you work? Do you everybody work? You make money? Some of you have sugar daddies at home. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> the rest of us work for our money, right? Okay, beautiful. So you guys work for a company. That company pays tax. And then that company pays you. And what do you do with that money? Before you do that, what do you do? Pay tax. Okay. Oh, yeah. So think about it. And then the people who are investors in that company that you work for, they make a piece of the profit and guess what they do with that money? Pay tax. Do you see? So we live in a little economic system of double taxation. Corporations pay tax. And then investors of the corporation pay tax and employees of the organization pay tax. Money is getting taxed twice, does everybody see? Okay, so check this out. As a sole proprietor, probably the biggest problem is you only pay tax once. What kind of tax do you pay? So what do we know about sole proprietorships? There's no legal separation between you and the business, so if you are the business, what kind of tax do you pay? What kind of tax do you all pay right now? Personal income tax. I heard. Is that what I heard? You. You all pay personal income tax, whether you realize it or not, you do. Okay? And so as the owner of this business, you will continue to do just that. You will pay personal income tax on running this organization, whatever you want. And this is the reason why most people remain as sole proprietors, because they don't want to have to pay both corporate tax yeah. and tax on their shares of the profit and sh and personal income tax on income that they're taking from the organization. Question. Um, so like, it would make sense if you're an online store to do this because like you don't have really liability as an online store. So here's when this makes sense. It honestly comes down to your budget. Okay? So think about this. If you are a brick and mortar store, a brick and mortar bakery, a brick and mortar whatever, if you've got people who are going to step foot from the public into your business, right? Your college. Do you want unlimited liability? No. Grandma's gonna come in and break her face and she's gonna sue you, if you like when I say that, yeah. and go after your house, your card, your dog, the shoes on your feet, the money in your bank. Not cool, right? However, if you are a small online upstart where the product that you're selling is relatively safe, you're not mixing, you know, I don't know, um, beauty products or something like that, you're not dealing with chemicals, and the whole startup cost of your business is maybe $1,000. Well, let me explain to you, I was gonna explain to you later, but I'll explain it to you now. Let me explain to you how much it is to become a corporation, okay? So to become a corporation, it's gonna cost you between 800, I'll explain what 800 is, and maybe $2,000. I'll explain what that is later, okay? To become a sole proprietor, you know how much it costs? Where am I? Nowhere here. Zero dollars. Literally zero dollars. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you can just think of a name in your head, boom, you are a sole proprietor. Right. 
Most people don't even realize they are a sole proprietorship. You bake a dozen cupcakes and sell them at a church basement sale, and you're operating as a sole proprietor whether you realize it or not. And you have unlimited liability. And if you make a transaction that hurts somebody, you are going to be on, you're exposing yourself to unlimited liability, okay? So, um, and by the way, if you wanna make your sole proprietorship official, you go down to your county courthouse, whatever county you do business in, and you get your DBA. DBA, doing business as. And doing business as costs you 13, 14, 15, 16 dollars, depends on the county that you do business in. And that's just registering the name of your sole proprietorship with the county that you're doing business in. You're basically just saying, hey, my name is John Conti, but JC Sandwich Shop is the name of the business. $14. So, $14 versus $2,000. You follow? So, this is the reason why most people, regardless of these things, remain sole proprietorships. Okay, questions about sole proprietorships. Now, in my evening class on Tuesday, I got down on my hands and knees and begged them to please consider, please consider um, a format, a legal format in part two, letter D of your business plan, other than sole proprietorship, okay? Think long and hard about whether it makes sense for you to be a sole proprietorship, okay? Done. Number two, two of three. Number two, number two is partnership. Okay, and there are three kinds of partnerships that I'm gonna to explain to you in one second, and they're gonna be a little bit confusing. You're gonna to have to go home and, and, and study them, all right? But generally speaking, a partnership is a sole proprietorship, generally, times the number of owners. How many owners can a partnership have? Two to unlimited. A partnership can be two people, can be five people. It can be, there can be 1,000 partners. If you look at law firms and accounting firms that are partnerships, sometimes they have 500 or 1,000 partners, okay? So that's what a partnership is. Now, there are three types of partnerships. Before we go there, let me define something for you and make sure you understand it before I explain to you the three types of partnerships. I need to explain to you GPs and LPs, okay? Tell me if you're with me. With me? GPs and LPs, make sure you understand these two. A GP, is a general partner, general. And an LP is a limited partner, limited, okay? What is the difference? Well, you just learned it actually. A general partner has unlimited liability, unlimited liability. So a general partner is kind of like a sole proprietor, right? What did we just say about sole proprietors? They have unlimited liability, okay? So a general partner has unlimited liability. A limited partner has limited liability. So a limited partner kind of operates like a corporation, and we haven't yet talked about corporations. We'll get there in one minute, okay? So you got two types of partners in these partnerships, GPs and LPs. Questions so far? This will help us understand the three types of partnerships. Does everybody understand what a partnership is in general? It's just two or more people, owners, coming together, right? Could have unlimited number of partners to own the organization. Okay, three types of partnerships. Number one is a general partnership. Here's how a general partnership works. In a general partnership, everybody is a general partner. So take a look. GP, 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 however many GPs I want, that's what a general partnership looks like. Everybody in the general partnership is a general partner. Therefore, everybody has unlimited liability. What does this smell like? <laughs> It smells like a sole proprietorship that just happens to have more than one owner. Agree? Because in this legal format, all the partners, however many they, there are, each of them has unlimited liability. So this is like a sole proprietorship times the number of partners there are. Okay? Number two, and I'll go back and review, a limited partnership. Here's what a limited partnership looks like. You have one GP and then an unlimited number of LPs, okay? So let me interpret this for you. You've got kind of one head honcho, one partner who maybe is like the main operating partner, maybe they're more of a majority owner of the business, and then you have as many LPs, limited partners, as the organization wants. Maybe it 
and start with one and grow to more, okay? And these LPs sometimes are maybe what we, you've heard of silent partner? Have you ever heard that term? Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. Silent partner, okay? Maybe or maybe not they're silent partners. So that means that really they're more like money investor than they are like wanting to operate the daily business. Not, not necessarily, but sometimes. Okay, I'll go back here in a second. The last one is an LLP. Okay, so look, GP, everybody's a GP. LP, one GP, lots of LPs. In an LLP, everybody's an LP. Limited part, okay? So an LLP smells a lot more like a corporation. Because in a corporation, all the owners of a corporation have limited liability. In this type of partnership, all of the partners have limited liability. What did we say the biggest drawback is of a sole proprietorship? The biggest issue with being a sole proprietor? Unlimited, Unlimited liability. Beautiful. Or just the idea that you have liability. Great. Okay. So, one more time. What is a partnership? A partnership is simply more than one owner of a business. Yeah. Um, it's like a sole proprietorship times the number of owners, okay? In a general partnership, everybody's a general partner. All partners have unlimited liability. In a limited partnership, you've got one dog, one top dog, and then unlimited numbers of limited partners. In a limited liability partnership, you have all limited partners. Questions before we get to pros and cons. Questions about partnerships. Like a corporation. It, it's similar to it, okay? It's not all the same legal structure, you'll see in one second, but it operates more similarly because all of the owner operators have limited, have limited liability, okay? Now, I'm gonna warn you guys about something. Be very careful who you start an entity with. Today's boyfriend and girlfriend is tomorrow's enemy. Today's loving mommy and daddy who are giving you money is tomorrow's, you know, money broke up the family, okay? Um, if you have somebody who wants to come into this venture with you, it would make so much more sense generally to take them on as a shareholder in a corporation than it would as a partner. Do you understand that? I'll tell you a quick story, if you don't understand. So you guys are my grandfather, and he lived to 102, but when he was a young guy, 80 years ago maybe, lived to 102, so probably was about 80 years ago, um, he wanted to make a real estate investment in New York, and he didn't have enough money to do that. So he asked his sister, hey sister, do you wanna come in with me on this real estate investment? Because together, let me just get to the pros and cons, because together, they were able to pool their financial resources to make a real estate investment. With me, right? Alone, either of them could not have made this real estate investment. So, let me fast forward 80 years. My grandfather dies at 102. His sister dies. They had a big gap between them. I forget how old she was. Uh, he, she dies. And then my grandfather's children and his sister's children inherit this business, this 80-year-old business. We don't even know each other, really, because the two sides of the family have nothing to do with each other. So now all of a sudden you've got these four strangers inheriting and owning a business they don't even know, we don't get along, obviously we have very different interests, fighting, <coughs> with me? One of the biggest drawbacks about partnerships is this and this. When you are a partner, Generally speaking, you can't just say, oh, I don't like you anymore, I'm piecing out, I'm gonna sell my half. Partnerships don't have continuity, okay? What does continuity mean again? You can't, sell. Sell. can't sell it, can't leave it in a will, you can't, okay? So yes, the physical things you own, you can leave in a will, but the business itself, because it's not a separate living, breathing entity, separate from yourself, you can't do things like sell it off. You can't do things like leave it in a will. Okay, so difficulty in withdrawing from a partnership, right? It's like more, you're creating a legal situation that's more than your own lifetime, interestingly enough, okay? 
if you die and own real property in a partnership. So it's a thing that you've got to really think long and hard about. And I think my example is a good one. So here I am, third generation of this family. I don't even know these, I guess they're my cousins. I don't know who they are. And yet I'm dealing with decisions that my grandfather made 80 years ago. Isn't that crazy? Right? Okay, so let's talk more about cons. Unlimited liability for whom? Who has unlimited liability? Beautiful, the general partners, okay? GPs in a partnership have unlimited liability. Their house, their car, their dog, their money in the bank, any property they own is now commingled in the business, okay? Um, potential for disagreements, lack of continuity, difficulty in withdrawing, so all of those examples. Um, on this side, so I wanna talk about this one. How many of you, before my little story anyway, were thinking about a partnership? You've identified somebody that maybe you want to go into business with. Be honest, okay? I am gonna guess that the reason that is true is because that other person or people have skills or knowledge or experience that maybe you don't have. Have I hit the nail on the head for somebody? Raise hands, okay? What is that knowledge set or experience? Great. Great, sure. Sometimes it's not necessarily experience, but availability of money, investment. How about for you? Yeah. Same. Money. Okay. Sometimes it's there's one creative person and there's one accounting finance person. Yeah. Sometimes it's um, somebody is on the East Coast and somebody's on the West Coast, and so together they can co-manage. Whatever the case is. Okay. So there's that. But let me say something to you. Why can't you all just bring on these individuals as shareholders in your corporation? That would be a much better solution. Why couldn't you just bring on these individuals as shareholders in your corporation? We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, questions about pros and cons. Let's go over one more time. In a general partnership, all partners are general partners, right? And they have? Beautiful. In a in a uh, general partner, in a uh, sorry limited partnership, we have one general, general partner, and then all of the partners are limited partners. In a limited liability partnership, everybody is a limited partner. Understood? It's just something that you're going to have to like look at, study a little bit, and memorize the order from general partner. Limited partner, limited liability partnership. Okay, let's get to what I really want to talk about today. And I would be really thrilled and happy, if it makes sense, to see lots of your part two letter Ds say, this is a corporation. Okay, so let's start with, all right, Mr. Conti, how could I be a corporation? It's just gonna be me at my kitchen table running this business. By the way, I don't even have a kitchen table, so I don't know, it would be me at my kitchen counter. Um, Please get out of your head the idea that a corporation has anything to do with size or number of employees. You all by your lonesome self at your kitchen table could be a corporation. Are you clear about that now? Yes? Yes? All corporation means is that you have set up a separate living, breathing, legal entity separate from you. Separate from your social security number, separate from your bank account, separate from your house, your car, your dogs, the, sh the shoes on your feet. Last week I said the dogs on your feet. <laughs> okay, whatever. Okay, so how do we start a corporation? Literally, how do we start? Okay, so let me just go off the slide, away from the slide for a second. Pretty much there's two ways to do it. You can do it on the cheap or you can do it expensively. On the cheap, LegalZoom.com or there's a couple of other vendors, all right? How much do they charge? $7.99. Not $7.99 either. $799, okay? About 800 bucks. What does LegalZoom do for you? Well, they do this stuff. Okay, I'll explain what this stuff is in a minute. On the more expensive side, you can go to a local attorney who specializes in setting up corporations, and he or she will probably charge you about mm, $1,500 to $2,000. Okay, a more experienced person's gonna charge you on the higher end. Okay, 
what do you get for two thousand dollars so the first thing they're going to do is they're going to draw up articles of incorporation okay legal ease legal jargon that's going to set up kind of the bylaws of your corporation let me just give you one example of a bylaw that would be baked into your corporation legal protection for yourself so let me just throw this out there let's just say that you start an organization and that organization becomes really, really, really successful. You are the next social media platform. You are the next big clothing brand. You are the next big commercial interior design firm. You need to make sure that you have set up for yourself something called a golden parachute. What does that mean? A golden parachute. What does that mean? Something that you can land on or something to fall on. Good, all right. Headed in the right direction there. It's a good guess. Yeah? What do you guys think a golden parachute is? It would be a legal clause in your articles of incorporation to protect yourself. Your company gets super successful. What do you want to make sure happens? You have money. If someone says your company and doesn't affect you, it's Okay. So as a default, the corporation does separate you. You, the person, are not the corporation. The corporation has its own credit. It's own EIN number, it's own everything. It's not you, it's not your social security number, it's not your bank account, it's not the things you own anymore. Legal separation. Golden parachute, I'm gonna tell you. It is a policy that you adopt for how much you would need to be paid out in the event of a sale or a takeover, right? So automatically you're baking in value into your corporation should it become successful and you either decide to sell or a company decides to try to buy you out you have baked into this a golden parachute a nice way to you know bow out does that make sense yeah. okay and then all, all types of other bylaws would go into this corporations have limited liability owners of the corporation that's a quiz question today who are the owners of a corporation? If you, by yourself, start a corporation at your kitchen table, who owns the corporation? Okay, you're like, well, who, who else could own it? Me. But you who? <coughs> you, the employee. You, the uh, CEO. Or you, the stockholder. No. Think about it. Mr. Davros is the CEO of Wade College, but he is not the owner of Wade College. Stockholder, correct. You, the shareholder, the stockholder, the investor, are the owner of the corporation. Do you understand that? Not you, the employee. You may never be an employee. I don't know. I don't even know if you're going to work for this organization or not. You probably are, right? But it is you, the shareholder, who owns the corporation. Do you understand that? Nope, that is a sole proprietorship. Because with a sole proprietorship, you've done nothing to create legal separation between you and the business, right? So my, my point is, is that you can just literally, right here, be a sole proprietor, right now. In fact, you guys are, if you're, if you're selling something and you haven't gone through this process, you're a sole proprietor, whether you realize it or not, okay? But my point is, is that as the shareholder of this corporation, maybe the only shareholder, your house, your car, your dog, the shoes on your feet are separate from the organization, its financial liabilities, et cetera. Okay, so um, LLC, we're actually gonna talk about three different types of corporations, three different types of corporate setups, but an LLC is basically a limited liability company, okay? And we're gonna talk more about types of corporations in one second, but I just wanna finish my point here. The owners of the corporation are the stockholders shareholders, investors, all those words mean the exact same thing. Are you clear about that? I can use the word stockholder, shareholder, investor. They all mean the same thing. They are who own the corporation. You can be the only shareholder in your corporation and the CEO and the employee, whatever you want to be. But the owner of a corporation is the stockholder, the shareholder. Okay. Now, by the way, there can also be institutional investors. Let's talk for one second about that. Does anybody have maybe a parent? Oh, I lost a button, you all saw that? 
Terrible. Maybe somebody can sew it for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'm in a good spot. It's going to sew my button back on for me. It's a good brass button, so. Anybody? You're like, no, I'm afraid to touch that casual jacket. <laughs> um, I'll let somebody sew my button on for me. At least. Keep it safe, all right? Um, yeah, all right. Want to get up? Want to get started right now? <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. But I'll meet me after class. <laughs> awesome. Um, what was I saying? So, oh, how many of you have a mama, a papa, a boyfriend, a girlfriend who maybe like wants to help you financially with your startup? Okay, great. So those are examples, and you might have thought of them five minutes ago as a partner, and I want that to get you out of that mindset. Those are examples of individual shareholders in your corporation. You take on your mother, your father, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your friend as an individual shareholder. Do you understand that? No. They make an investment in your organization and they become a shareholder in the organization. If they also want to be, if you want to hire them as an employee, I don't care, whatever that is, but they claim a stake of ownership in your company as a shareholder, okay? In this case, not as a partner. There are no partners in a corporation only shareholders, only stockholders in the organization. Okay, but there also might be institutional investors. Does anybody know what an institutional investor is? So an individual investor is just the person, your mother, your father, Mr. Conti maybe, right? Maybe I invest in your business. I'm an individual investor. What are institutional investors? I'll give you two words. Could be banks. Um, and generally when banks invest, um, when banks invest, not, I'm not talking about a loan that you're going to pay back and the bank's going to be out of your hair forever. But when a bank invests, they usually call either venture capital or private equity firms. Have you heard of this? We have lots of these in Dallas. Many, many, many. Dallas is, you go through Highland Park and you see those mansions, No. Yeah? down Preston, and you know what I'm talking about? If you haven't, you need to go see them because they will blow you away. <laughs> I can promise you most of those big mansions, those are private equity venture capital people. What does a private equity or venture capital firm do? What do they do? They're like a bank, except you're not banking there with a checking and savings account. What do you think those banks do? Well, you're giving you're money, money, people with ideas. Give is a, you know, a give, invest. You got it. They invest in the next big thing. And let me tell you, these venture capital private equity firms, man, for every like 100 startups they invest in, 90 of them kaput. But listen, for every 100 they invest, 10 are the next big. No. Man, I can think back to, um, when there was a brand new startup called 1-800-Flowers. Nobody had heard of it. This idea of networking, little florists all around the country that had no technology, no ability to even sell anywhere for outside of a couple mile radius. And JP Morgan Chase, private equity, invested. And guess what? 1-800-Flowers became a multi-billion dollar corporation. Now they 1-800-Flowers.com. They're basically a giant network of every little local florist in the country, okay, through a computer system. That's what these venture capital private equity firms do. They are institutional investors. They're looking to invest for partial ownership in startups like maybe yours, if you have a really solid competitive advantage. We have so many private equity firms in Dallas, it's ridiculous, okay? Okay, then the other thing that Sharehold that, that corporations need, right? We've written our articles in the corporation. We have corporate bylaws. What one example did I give you of a corporate bylaw? Should be the most important corporate bylaw that you would be interested in. A golden parachute clause, right? The idea of like, well, what happens to me, the founder, the original shareholder, should I get bought out or should I decide to sell the company, right? So we want to adopt some kind of really attractive thing for ourselves, right? Isn't the idea of, here, of this to get wealthy? Is anybody in here starting a nonprofit? 
kumbaya, my lord, we're here to save the, you know, whatever. <laughs> no, no, you're all starting a for-profit company, yes? Yeah. Great, that's the point of this class, okay? And so what are you looking to ultimately do? Enrich yourselves. And so these corporate bylaws protect that, to ensure that you're going to enrich yourself in the event that you start something successful. You start something that's gonna fail, you ain't enriching this monkey, all right? Okay, and then also, corporations need a board of directors. And let me just say this, this generally, this could just be like, you know, somebody you know, a mentor, or somebody that maybe somebody from the industry, probably should not be employees, okay? Because a board of directors is supposed to be who the CEO reports to. You. You, the CEO. What, Mr. Conti, my company, I have to report to somebody? Technically, yes, because corporations are supposed to operate in the interest of shareholders, even if you're the only shareholder. So, you know, perhaps you'll invite me to be on your board of directors. And these are generally unpaid people who just kind of help steer the company in the right direction. Okay, so I do want to talk about pros and cons, right? We've talked about sole proprietorships, partnerships, I want to talk about corporations. But first, really important, I want to teach you about three types of corporations. Really important. S-Corp, C-Corp, Nonprofit Corp, all right? Make sure you know these. We're gonna hear about S-Corp in our little video today. So let me start there. S-Corp, I think S-Corp is one of the most brilliant ways to go. I really do. What did we say the biggest pro of being a sole proprietor is? Who remembers? What is the biggest pro? Why do, even though it's so dangerous, why do most businesses elect to be and stay and remain sole proprietors? Single tax. Perfect. Okay. Let me throw down on you as corporation. You're going to love it. Ready for it? S corporation does not pay corporate tax. Feel like I'm Oprah. <laughs> you don't get to pay tax, and you don't get to pay tax, and none of you get to pay tax. Okay, why not? Why does an S corporation not pay? What is it, a nonprofit? No, 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 it's any for profit organization. This could be you, okay? Well, what it does is it takes all of its net income, okay? The net income that it makes, right? And it has to, it has to distribute that net income to the shareholders. So basically, this type of corporation does not retain its own net income. Now, don't get me wrong. It makes money, it pays bills, right? But the net income, the remaining income, I'm not gonna quite call it profit, but almost, has to get distributed to the shareholders. And then guess what the shareholders do? Well, yes, that's what I just said. So the net income of the corporation gets distributed to the shareholders, but then guess what the shareholders have to do? Pay tax, understood? So in this situation, you're only getting tax on the money. What? Do you understand? Yes or no, tell me if you don't. Tell me if you don't. I heard a couple of head shaking. Okay. So remember what, what, what I said earlier, corporation is, right? How many of you guys work for a company? Raise your hands, okay? So your company has to pay tax on the money it makes. You don't see that as an employee, obviously, but you're, I promise you your company pays corporate tax. And then shareholders pay tax on shares of the profit that they make. And you are paying tax on the money you make from the corporation, yes? What tax do you pay again? What tax do you pay at Home Depot? Ordinary income tax, okay? In this situation, this little setup, in this little way to kind of get around the government, the S Corporation does not pay corporate tax. Why not? Because it takes all of its net income and it has to distribute it to the shareholders. Now, for you all, you might be the only shareholder, right? So what do you have to do? You as the owner of this corporation have to take all the income, net income, the income left over after you paid your bills. And then you will pay only income tax on it. What does it smell like? Yeah, 
This smells like a sole proprietorship, but with all the legal protections of a corporation. Okay, there's only one drawback. You know, there's always gotta be a, a, a catch, right? Of course. So the catch is simple. You can only have up to 100 shareholders. Okay, so you might say, Mr. Consi, like, I'm never gonna have 100 shareholders. Okay, that's fine. But what does this then all of a sudden prevent? What can an S corporation never do? Correct. Good. Yes. She said go public. An S corporation can only ever remain private. You can never be a publicly traded S corporation. Why not? Because how many shareholders does a publicly traded corporation have? Unlimited. Millions. Billions. Not billions, but hundreds of millions maybe of shareholders. Okay? So only private corporations with less than 100 shareholders can be an S corporation. Where the corporation does not file corporate taxes, all of the shareholders get all of the net income and then they pay tax on that net income, okay? And so, man, as an individual, if you are a sole shareholder of a corporation, this is the perfect legal setup. Do you get it? Because what, are, what else are you gonna do with the income of the company? You're gonna take it, yes? Yes or no? I don't know, maybe some of you are gonna throw it off the George Washington Bridge, I don't know. But for the rest of you, you all are going to take the income of the, of the corporation, the net income. So this is the perfect way to avoid having to file corporate tax returns and simply be liable as the only person to get the dividends from the company. Okay, that's an S Corp. C Corp is the type of setup that you become when you eventually think either you're gonna have more than 100 shareholders, more than 100 investors, or if you ultimately have the goal of going public, okay? Lots of companies, lots of startups, especially if you're a tech startup or some type of, you're the next big thing, you have the anticipation of going public, that you're gonna sell shares of your company stock to a public stock exchange, okay? Then you cannot be an S corporation, because you'll never be able to do that. So you're a C corporation. Unlimited shareholders, preferred for IPO. Who knows what IPO is? No? Initial public offering. What is an initial public offering? It's the first time a cor private corporation sells shares of stock to the public, okay? And this is when, you know, the next big thing makes, rakes in their millions and billions, okay? And then obviously C corporations pay tax. They pay tax they file a corporate tax return, okay? Does everybody understand the difference between an S-Corp and C-Corp? Does an S-Corp pay tax? No. Do they not pay tax because they're like a nonprofit? Because they do good? No, why don't they pay tax? Why does an S-Corp not pay tax? Because what? Go ahead, say it again. Uh, they're private, well C-Corp is private too, and nonprofit is private as well. We'll get there in one, one second. You got it, exactly. Because all of the money goes to the stockholders, the shareholders, okay? And, and not all the money. We gotta pay our bills and we gotta operate our business, we gotta pay our employees, but the net income, the income left over, goes to the shareholders, okay? And what do the shareholders do? What do they have the burden of doing? Paying tax. Got it? Okay, easy. Yes. Yes, board of directors, yes. So, like, they don't get paid why would you be on the board of yeah, uh, people do it for prestige. People do it because they like to say that I'm on the board of directors of these yeah. corporations. Yeah. Um, lots of people do it because they might get discounted ability to invest. So they'll sit on your board of directors for free, but they're gonna buy shares of stock to become investor in the company. So is it normally like the majority, like they have like the most stocks in the company? Maybe, it depends, maybe, maybe not. Okay. Um, Wade College's Board of Trustees, so we have a Board of Trustees, they get paid absolutely nothing and they have absolutely no investment in, the, in, in Wade College. They do it simply because they're, you know, because they want to give back and they want to help like oversee the, the direction of our organization. So, and then, you know, another, like my old boss at Ralph Warren, I probably shouldn't say this on camera, but um, she was on the Board of Trustees for Weight Watchers. You guys don't know Weight Watchers mm -hmm. Corporation? They paid her like $300,000 a year just to like go to a meeting. Wow. Not a Weight Watchers meeting, a, 
of board of trustees in it. They paid her like $300,000 a year because she was a division president of a really big company and they wanted her, you know, feedback, advice, direction. So that was a sweet gig, right? <laughs> and unlimited Weight Watchers too. Okay, anyway, so does everybody understand the difference between S Corp and C Corp? S Corp, how many shareholders? 100 or less. C Corp, how many investors? Unlimited. Beautiful. S Corp doesn't pay tax, C Corp pays corporate tax. Okay, nonprofit. So, what is a nonprofit organization? You probably all know, right? What is a nonprofit organization? Well, it's an organization that does some type of community good, whatever it is. It could be you're a religious institution. You are an institution that saves the whales, that saves the planet, that saves the who knows what, okay? What a nonprofit does is it files a 501c3. Have you heard of this? Yes? 501c3, now let me tell you something right now. This is a report form. The government does not play around. You can't, you know, you can't say, well, I'm gonna start a nonprofit, I'm gonna make people look cute, because my, my goal in the world is I'm gonna make people look cute. That, that ain't a nonprofit, okay? The government doesn't just allow anybody to deem themselves a nonprofit. Why not? Because nonprofit organizations, they're exempt from tax, period. You with me? Now let me just say one quick thing and we'll move on. The word nonprofit is really misunderstood, okay? Nonprofit does not mean that these companies can't make a profit or don't make a profit. Of course these companies make a profit. I don't care what we're talking about. A local church, if they didn't make a profit, how do you think they would operate, right? Church has to run profitably. It has to pay the electric bill. It has to pay its rent. It has to pay its, its land lease. The, the preacher has to drive a Mercedes S-Class and have a private jet, okay? And, 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 and build these massive structures and live in a 16-bedroom house, okay? How else would pastors survive in this business? So even nonprofit organizations, they absolutely have to run profitably. It's just that 80% of their income has to go back out to doing whatever the benevolent thing is that they are claiming they do. You with me? Only 20% of the income that they take in can be used for the private jet and the operation expenses and all that kind of stuff. What are you gonna do? So we're? No. Uh, <laughs> you said it, not me. I only alluded to it. Okay, so that's what a nonprofit is, okay? Now, let me also make clear something. You operate a nonprofit, you have employees, employees have a salary, those employees still pay income tax. You clear about that? You go work for a nonprofit, that doesn't mean you don't pay income tax, you pay income tax. It's just that the corporation itself is exempt from taxes. It does not pay income tax, sales tax, all that kind of stuff, and corporate tax, okay? Trick question, how many shareholders can a nonprofit have? No, there are no shareholders, you follow? Nonprofits cannot take in investments, okay? Because the purpose of them is not to build shareholder value. They're not here to make the value of an investment go up. They can take donations, obviously. They cannot take investments. Okay, so now I'm ready finally for pros and cons. So raise your hand right now, but before I even go there, raise your hand right now if you think being a corporation has more pros than cons. More pros. Really? That's it? I have not done my job well today. So raise your hand if you think corporation has fewer pros. You think there's more drawbacks. Okay, and half of you just not voting. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Maybe you don't understand the question, I'm not sure. But, so what are the pros? I want to start on the pros side, okay? To me, the absolute biggest pro, and I've already, I think I've made this point like a hundred times today, limited liability. Your house, your car, your dog, the shoes on your feet, the money in your bank account are all separate. The only thing you are liable for is the money that you put into the corporation, okay? You invest money in the corporation, you bring your own money into the corporation, you are liable for just that. Corporation goes bankrupt, you lose that money. No more. You know what a corporation can do? 
gets sued. A corporation can sue. A corporation can sign a lease. A corporation can buy land. It can buy property. It can lease a vehicle. Not you. I know you can do all those things, but your corporation can do that as well. A corporation can commit a crime. Maybe I shouldn't tell you this, but a corporation can commit a crime. A corporation can get punished for committing that crime. And again, it's not you, it's the corporation. What do you mean uh, yeah. by that? Corporation can commit white collar crime. Okay. So Talked about in lots of examples that of that. Right. Corporation can commit accounting fraud. It can commit sexual harassment. It can commit um, tax evasion. So it can commit, uh, what else? I don't know, discriminatory hiring practices, right? Not you, the corporation, okay? And it can get tried, it can get convicted, it can get fined, punished. When you like get punished, like who's getting punished? Yeah. The corporation. Well, like CFO, CEO. So it depends. Depends on right what? now. Well, all we're doing is talking about private corporations. So private corporations, you guys remember Sarbanes-Oxley, none of that applies to private corporations. So who's getting tried and fined? The corporation. But you're like, wait a minute, in this country, the corporation is people. The corporation. So what is the punishment? It could be things like um, forced community service, forced spending on, we talked about those examples, environmental cleanup, things like that, okay? So it's the corporation committing the crime and the corporation getting punished and fined. Okay, limited liability. Is everybody now 100% crystal clear as to what that means? Yes? It is a legal separation between you, your social security number, your personal property, and the companies, all right? Um, the other thing is, corporations can take out a loan. Not you, the corporation. Corporations can do things like Take on more shareholders. Let's say your company is pretty successful and now you want to expand, but you don't have the income to do it. What can you do? Take on more shareholders. Take on additional investors who become shareholders to raise more capital. What can you do with that capital? Build more stores. Enhance your website. Hire more employees. Build, you know, make more product. Okay. Um, look at this bullet. I know I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit. Continuity. What does that mean? As a corporation, you have continuity. What's it mean? You can sell it. You can sell your shares. You can leave your shares in a will when you die. You can pass it along to your next of kin. Okay. Why? Because it's separate from you personally. Because it is a living, breathing, legal entity separate from you, the person. Okay? It can be transferred, it can be sold, it can be passed in the will. Beautiful. Okay, good. Disadvantages. So let me just narrow this down. Cost. How much did we say? Yeah, $800 to $2,000 cost. Okay. Let me just say one quick thing about that. If your business requires $50,000 startup, it's going to cost you $50,000 to start the business. You guys, $2,000 is just one small budget item on a list of items that is well worth it to give yourself this legal protection and to make sure that your company lives. Yes? But if your startup is at your kitchen table and the total cost of starting your business is $500, then maybe it isn't worth the giant expense. Question? Yeah, I had a question because um, years ago I, I tried to do that. And I was speaking with a company, and um, the the response I was getting back just didn't seem like it was honest after I paid. What what company? A, a law firm? Um, it was a legal legal something that uh -huh. I found on the internet. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So um, I had started talking to them about it, and uh, we were getting into the financial part of it. So I paid a portion of it, and then things started to get kind of crazy. And I knew one of my clients that had. Um, reached out to somebody, put the product on there, and they literally sold it from her to a family member that lived in another state, uh -huh. which was far away, and ended up using it and coming out with her product. Okay, so a so, couple of things. Right. One is, in your business plan, before you even go to see an attorney or do-it-yourself, self-service on legal.com, right. 
in your business plan, you always have a uh, confidentiality clause. And by the way, if any of you want me to sign a confidentiality clause, I'd be more than happy to do that. What is a confidentiality clause? Well, it's just a paragraph, a statement, maybe a page, that says all of the internal data in this thing is owned by, is the idea of, and the legal property of your name, you the person, your name, okay? And so that gives you the legal recourse if somebody were to steal large portions of your concept to sue. A confidentiality contract. That's a piece of it. You'll see it, Google it. Um, you probably won't see it in the example that I posted on Jupiter, but you can Google it and find one. You can do it now if you want to see it. Uh, a confidentiality clause or a confidentiality contract. I'd be more than happy to sign one. I can, I've been doing this for 11 years. I have never stolen any concept of my students, okay? You're gonna be successful. I want you to be successful. I got my own thing, all right? So there's that. Um, but anyway, my point is, is that maybe expense is the biggest drawback. Maybe it does not make sense for you to spend 800 or $2,000 drawing up these documents, but it probably does, okay? And then the other biggest disadvantage is double taxation. Everybody clear about that? Corporation pays tax, and then you pay tax really twice, three times. Corporation pays tax, you pay tax as a shareholder, and you pay tax as an employee. Employees pay income tax, shareholders pay tax on their dividends, corporations pay corporate tax. Okay, one way around that is a S corp. They call it sub chapter S corporation, S corp. Yes, okay. Um, boom, okay, good. How are we doing? Good? Let's review before we go on. So, sole proprietorship, how many owners? One, good, one. What's the biggest drawback? Unlimited liability. Partnership, how many owners? Two or more, two to unlimited, beautiful. Um, is it 100% limited liability? Do partnerships have 100% limited liability like a corporation? No. no, it depends. Depends on what type of partners there are. There are general partners and limited partners. Corporation, who owns the corporation? The Correct, shareholders, stockholders, right? The investors, <laughs> they are the ones who own the corporation. Okay, good, all right. Super. couple other miscellaneous things I wanna talk about. Is everybody clear, I kinda of think we really covered this well today, about the difference between public and private corporations. So I, I, I threw that word around earlier and I wanna make sure you're clear about it. Do you understand the difference, yes or no? Yes? How many of you say no? Not really, appreciate it, okay, beautiful. So, Uber, Airbnb, Mars, look at Mars Corporation, they have the weirdest portfolio of brands. They do candy, food, and like dog and cat food. I pray to God <laughs> not in the same factory, because that's just gross, okay? My favorite is Twix. Let me tell you something. I have two favorite things in my life. Sprinkles cupcakes, you might have seen that on exam number one, and Twix bars. Those are like the things I live for, all right? And I just pray they're not made in the same factory as Whiskers cat food. But anyway, these huge corporations are private. What does that mean? So these huge corporations have investors, they have shareholders, stockholders. But who are these shareholders, stockholders, investors? Who are they? Yeah. Private people. Yeah, private people, right? They're private people. Or maybe in institutional investors like private equity firms. Can you and I buy shares of stock in these companies? Yes or no? No. no. And I'm grabbing, oh I can't grab my phone because I'm using it to film this. But um, if I were to grab my phone, I would look up their stock symbols. They don't exist. Walmart, Facebook, and Procter & Gamble are publicly traded companies. Can you and I buy shares of stock in these companies? Yes. We can go on the New York Stock Exchange, look these guys up. Um, I looked up Tuesday, Walmart was trading for $112. So if you wanted to buy one share of Walmart stock, it would cost you $112. Okay? And you can buy it. How do you do it? I'll show you in two weeks when we get to our little financial lecture, which I'm very excited about. It's my favorite lecture. Mm -hmm. Okay, publicly traded companies. Who owns Walmart? The public. Got it? Who owns Walmart? Any member of the world who owns shares of stock in Walmart. They are the owners of Walmart. I own Walmart. Not the whole thing, a very, very tiny fraction of it. <laughs> Okay? Publicly traded companies are owned by public shareholders. Private companies are owned by private shareholders. 
What's Wayne College? Private. private. We are a private corporation. Who are the shareholders at Wayne College? Me. No, you are not. You know how I know that? Because you cannot buy shares of stock in the company, neither can I. Why not? Because you can't go on the New York Stock Exchange and look up Wade College and find it and invest. Who owns Wade College? Miss Wade. Wade and her husband and her two, their two daughters and the five grandchildren. They are all the shareholders of the corporation. You follow? Three generations of family. Okay? It's a private corporation. Private corporation. Okie dokie. Yes, I can. Absolutely. Thank you for asking. Public versus private. All you got to know is private is private shareholders and public is public shareholders. That's all. Okay. Now, let me just set up the next slide. We're almost done, like two slides left. Short chapter, short lecture. So, who brought up franchising earlier? Deshaun maybe, or who had brought up franchising? Somebody did, no? Okay, so we talked a little bit in this class about franchising. The last time I mentioned it, it was more like one way to go overseas, right, was to franchise. Who remembers what franchising is? Could be, and remember that it's not just fast food. Too fast? Good, good, yeah, okay. Um, it's not just fast food, every industry has franchising. Every industry, real estate companies, every industry, hotels. Franchising, quiz question, has a franchisee and a franchisor. I wanna to explain to you what this means and why I'm talking about this in this chapter. Okay, so the franchisor, OR, is the corporation, it's the, it's the company, it's the brand, it's the recognizable brand that's selling a right to own a piece of itself. But here's the point I wanna make. Bless you, bless you. The franchisee is the local owner operator, right? The individual who is paying for the right to own and operate a piece the one McDonald's, the one Starbucks, the one whatever. And here's the point I wanna make. A franchisee could be a sole proprietorship, a partnership, or a corporation. So let me explain. If I go buy a McDonald's, I could be a sole proprietor buying the McDonald's. I could be a member of a partnership and a partnership buys the McDonald's. Or I could start John Conti's uh, XYZ Corporation and my corporation buys the McDonald's. So the franchisee, the local owner operator, could be a sole proprietorship, a partnership, or a corporation. Okay? What's good? What are the pros? Why do people want to franchise? So you got McDonald's, you got Subway. Subway is the number one growing franchise in the world, fastest growing franchise in the world. Why do people want to buy into franchises? Yeah. I have a client that has seven pop-offs. Yeah, yeah. So. Do you guys, well, I'm gonna tell you cost in a second, but okay. so here's the deal, say it. What are you buying into? Existing clientele. Yeah, you're buying into a massive marketing machine with an already identifiable brand. When you buy at McDonald's, you know McDonald's have 99.5% success rate. Do you know how often a McDonald's fails? half of 1% of the time. So there's 6,000 McDonald's in the world, fewer than like 200 of them go out of business a year. Of 6,000. So a 99.5% success rate, guaranteed success rate, because the formula works and the company is selling a piece of the formula, okay? So the biggest pro is risk, recognition. The biggest con is cost. Do you know how much a McDonald's costs? You have to have a minimum of a million dollars, cash or financing, in order to get into the McDonald's program. By the way, do you know what the McDonald's program is called? Don't laugh, I'm not making it up. <laughs> Hamburger University. Oh, that's cute. It is cute, right? <laughs> it is. Hamburger University is basically the franchising training program. But to get accepted into it, you have to have a million dollars in cash or financing. Subway, $180,000. Chick-fil-A, $50,000. Cool. Yep. One could own and operate a Chick-fil-A with a minimum $50,000 investment. So, um, but Subway is the fastest growing franchise in the world. 
in the world. It's outpacing McDonald's. Um, when you were talking about like how you can have a sole proprietorship corporation, or whatever, yes. does it apply that like if somebody you have a McDonald's and somebody slipped in your McDonald's, like you would be responsible? For no. That? So when somebody slips and falls in your McDonald's, you are covered by the corporation. You are you are part of the franchisor, the overall corporation. You yourself. Obviously, if you're operating a McDonald's and that McDonald's is open to the public and people are coming on your sales floor, you probably want to be a corporation as well, yeah, or, or a partnership with limited liability. Because it is a lot of liability, right? You're dealing with equipment and hot food and employees who might get hurt. So yes, but generally speaking, you are covered by the, the legality of the corporation that you're franchising from. Sure, I mean, they can sue both entities, yeah? yeah? You walk into McDonald's and break your face, you might choose to sue McDonald's Corporation and the local owner operator, right? Two, two bang for your buck, no pun intended, all right? You burn, the, you burn yourself on the coffee, you might be suing the local owner operator and the, and the corporation. Okay, so, did everybody get what a franchise is? Yes, it is a franchisee, local owner operator, paying a franchisor for the right to own and operate a piece of an existing brand. Okay, beautiful. Last slide, but hold on. Before I go to the last slide, I want to go back here for one second. So, you already learned today the difference between a private and a public corporation, and we all understand what a corporation is, yes? A corporation is legal, separate, living, breathing entity from the founder, owner, starter of the business. I want to say one quick thing. We'll go to our last slide. Private corporations do not have to grow. Public corporations, 100% must grow, must grow every single year. They must grow every single year. And that's what my last slide is about, and I want to explain to you why. Okay, why? Why does a private corporation not have to grow? Wade College, you guys, we have, what do we have, 250 students? We don't need more students. We absolutely don't. There's no pressure to have more students. We don't go out of our way to get more students. We don't need more students. Nobody is saying we must have more students. We don't need them. In fact, we choose not to have them. It's kind of a nice problem to have. When employers call, they recruit for jobs, and we say, sorry, we have no more students left. They all have jobs or internships. It's kind of a nice thing. Why don't we have to grow? Why don't we have to become a thousand students? We don't have anybody to pay that, but investors. Correct. We have investors, right? but they're only private investors, and Miss Wade ain't going anywhere. And her daughter isn't going anywhere. And they don't really care about return on investment, okay? But public corporations like Walmart, that I just told you, how much is a share of Walmart two days ago? $112, is that what I said? Walmart has to grow every year, they have to. Why? Who owns Walmart? Public shareholders. And what do public shareholders demand? Correct, a return on their investment. And what happens if the value of Walmart goes down? Right, they'll sell their shares and the value of Walmart Corporation will go down. Okay, so, Wade College, don't have to grow. Walmart has to grow. How can Walmart grow? How can Walmart make more money next year? Open more stores, great. What else you got? How can Walmart grow? Take on more brands, great. Sell new types of product, great. Pack out the square footage with more inventory to sell. Beautiful, what else you got? So more sales, more stores. What else you got? Less employees, switch. Cut costs, great. More technology. Great. Uh, more automated stuff, less employees. Over time, you make more money that way, sure. What else you got? Raise prices. Great, raise prices. That might generate more revenue. Maybe lowering prices could also generate more revenue, but good, good, okay, good. Let me say something, and I'm setting up my last slide for, the, for this lecture. Sometimes you can't do those things. Sometimes you have maxed out your ability to open more stores, or to raise or increase your prices, or to bring more product into your already crowded stores. Sometimes you gotta figure out as a publicly traded company another way to grow. And that's what I'm about to show you, okay? Once you go from being private to public, 
like companies like Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy. Familiar? Yes or no? No? Well, let me show you. Once upon a time, there was just Louis Vuitton. And Louis Vuitton, at the time, was just leather, leather goods, just hard goods, okay? There was another company called Moet Champagne. And by the way, only champagne made in champagne can be called champagne. Did you know that? Yeah. You, not all sparkling white wine can be called champagne unless it comes from champagne. Okay, otherwise it's just sparkling wine. Champagne is a, a, a name brand? Champagne is a city. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a city. And so only sparkling white wine that comes from champagne can be called champagne. Anyway, so that's Moet Champagne. And then Hennessy is cognac. It is a dark spirit, brown spirit, all right? Hennessy. <laughs> These three companies were private companies. And then they, hold on, merged. Now, by the way, I want you to label this final slide growth, growth. And the first two words have to do with buy. And the last two words have to do with sell. Okay, but what am I talking about here? Ways in which publicly traded companies grow. Ways that are not open more stores, sell more products, do more marketing, lay off people. Ways that companies grow. Okay, so take a look. These three companies became one new company. Louis Vuitton and Moet and Hennessy became LVMH, a new corporation. That's a merger. A merger is where two or more companies come together to form a new company. Now let me ask you a question. Louis Vuitton had a marketing department. Old Moet had a marketing department. Hennessy had a marketing department. Each had a human resources department. Each had a finance department. Each had a product development department. Do we need three? Do we need three? No. No. What do you think the merger resulted in? Layoffs. Layoffs. Got it. Layoffs. And layoffs enable now these three companies to operate more profitably, right? Now we're running three businesses with fewer, little overhead, less overhead. See, okay. That is one way for companies to grow, by merging. Okay, now, since this merger, LVMH every year has purchased companies. Take a look. Take a look at Sephora. Did you know? Where is Sephora? Where is Sephora? You see it? Where? Far right bottom. Here, boom, thank you, good eye. How many of you knew that Louis Vuitton owns Sephora? Why would they own Sephora? Say it again. It wasn't when they purchased it. In fact, most of these companies were not profitable when they purchased them. We'll get to that point in a second. But why would LV want to own Sephora? Well, think about what's in Sephora. Think about what is inside of Sephora. What's in Sephora? Fragrance. What brands of makeup, skincare, and fragrance? It is a ret is the ability for them to retail their own goods. Not 100%. They also carry other brands, but a lot of what's inside Sephora is LVMH brands. It's another opportunity to sell more of their own goods. See? Okay. So, what is an acquisition? An acquisition is where company A buys company B. Right? Company A buys company B. Now, company B gets to keep its name, its brand, its image, its everything. It stays itself. But company A buys company B. Now, I kind of just answered my own question, but when does a company like LVMH acquire another company? So here's LVMH. They have purchased over 61 companies. When do you think they purchase a company like Aqua de Parma, an Italian fragrance house, or um, Dior, or Givenchy, or Marc Jacobs? Marc Jacobs is the first American brand that LVMH purchased, acquired. When? Yeah, 
Exactly. When the value of the company is low, but LVMH believes what? Just like buying a house. When do you want to buy a house? <laughs> Agree? Anybody in here want to buy a house at the top of the market where you can pay maximum dollar for it? Of course not. When do you want to buy a house? No. When the market is low or when you can buy something that you can get on the cheap and do some stuff to it. What do you think LVMH does to these companies when they buy them? That's fix the marketing, get rid of product that isn't selling, right? Fire people that are not performing. You got it. Okay, so does anybody know from the news lately what company LVMH, this might be like number 62 or three, is bidding on? They're offering like $15 billion to buy this company. Anybody know? Nobody? It was huge news last week. What? They, if you look at all of their portfolio of brands, they only do super luxury. They really only focus on super luxury. Nobody? Tiffany and Company. Where am I? Oh, wow. Boom, boom, boom. There we go, boom, Tiffany. They are making a $15 billion bid on Tiffany and Company. Why? Because they really don't have a stronghold on luxury jewels, right? Fine jewelry, okay? So, does everybody understand what a merger and an acquisition is? Yes or no? Yes. Merger, two companies come together, they form what? A new company, great. LVMH, Louis Vuitton, Moet, and Hennessy, three companies came together, they formed a new company called LVMH. Acquisition is where a company A buys company B, right? When, if Louis Vuitton gets to purchase Tiffany, that's an acquisition. How many acquisitions has LVMH made? 60? So, both of these are companies buying companies. <coughs> Number three, divestiture. To divest something means to sell. If I divest this button of mine, has fallen off, I me it means I'm gonna sell it. So, let me just go back to my little chart. Every year LVMH sells a company, sometimes two. A couple of years ago, LVMH actually sold Aqua de Parma, the Italian fragrance house. They bought it when the company was a hot mess. They did some really amazing marketing. How many of you know Aqua de Parma? They sell it at Neiman's and Nordstrom's and Saks. It's a beautiful fragrance house. And they sold it. You know what they sold it for? A giant profit. See? So in some years, LV grows not by selling more bags or more fragrance, but by selling a company. Do you get it? Do you get why companies divest? Why do companies divest? To, to, just say that word we wrote. Grow, grow. All of these are things we're gonna to do to grow as publicly traded companies, okay? We merge to grow, we acquire to grow, we divest to grow. Who's lost? No worries. So, I am John Conti Sandwich Shop. I am selling as many sandwiches as I possibly can, okay? There's no other way for me to grow. I'm selling as many sandwiches as I can. So I may choose first to merge with another sandwich company. John Conti Sandwich Shop might merge with, you know, the dude down the block and we become the same brand. So now we're growing. How are we growing? Because it's double the sales. I might decide to buy a sandwich shop. I'm gonna buy a second location. What does that do? It helps me grow. I might decide one day to sell that sandwich shop. So that sandwich shop has now increased in value. I sell that sandwich shop off. That money is my growth for the year, okay? So merger, company A and company B become company C. Acquisition, company A buys company B. Divestiture, company A sells company B. Okay, last story, spinoff. Now I'm gonna talk about the rest of the stuff on my little slide. How many of you know the company Express? How many of you know Express? The retailer like in all malls across America, right, Express? Okay. About, I don't know, 20 years ago, Express had a little fixture in the back 
corner of its stores. And on this fixture was bubble bath, body wash. This was the 90s, so like body spray. Do they still make body spray? Yeah. Is that still a thing? Yeah, body spray, like in the little spritz thing. And I don't know what else, lotion, all right? And that product was really, really, really successful. So successful, and it only came in like two fragrances. One was Freesia, I'll never forget. It. So 90s, Freesia, I forgot what the other one was. So successful that this company, Express, spun it off into a whole other business, even though it was its own business, called? Is it Bath and Body Works? Bath and Body Works. Wow. Bath and Body Works. Cool. Which Bath and Body Works and Express are both owned by L Brand, same corporation. Okay, spin off. Here's another example. Nordstrom. You guys all know Nordstrom? Yeah? Anybody work for Nordstrom? Do you work for Nordstrom? Nobody? Yeah, Had a bunch? Oh, you do? Hi, welcome. <laughs> Nordstrom. And by the way, it's Nordstrom. One Nordstrom, two Nordstrom, three Nordstrom, four Nordstrom. Nordstrom, no S. Oh. Epi of mine, Nordstrom. So, Nordstrom designed a private label brand called Fasonab. It sounds French, but it, it literally made in Seattle, Washington, okay? And so they sold this brand, Fasonab, on their retail sales floors, and it was super successful, okay? People really treated it like it was a designer brand, and it was very popular. So much so that Nordstrom wound up spinning Fasonab off as a separate freestanding business, and then actually eventually divested, sold it, and you want to hear something crazy? To this day, Nordstrom actually buys Fasenab to carry in its stores. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Like it was a product that it manufactured itself, sold it as a separate company, yet it still carries it in its stores. Okay, these are spin-offs. What is company A doing? Like making the, the, their company from what they already have. Beautiful, yeah. Basically they're incubating something from within. You get it? They're incubating something from within and spinning it off into a separate standing business. Victoria's Secret did this with pink, mm -hmm. right? Also L Brands. So that's a spin off. Why do companies do this stuff? Perfect. Ready for a quiz? Yeah. Here we go. Actually, no, we're going to watch a video first. Yeah. Amy's expert. Okay, let me set this up for exam number two. Exam number two. You want another question? Yes? What three major decisions did Amy make about this business? To set this business up. Who were the three major decisions? How many of you guys have been to Amy's Ice Cream in Austin, Texas? There's nine of them. One is in that really cool neighborhood, SoCo, <laughs> South Congress. Nobody? It's like a big thing in Austin, this like local, you been? You, you know it? Lived in Austin? Cool. So you know Amy's, right? It's a big, it's a thing in Austin. You guys, Amy was planning to go to med school and then wound up getting into this business. She made $3 million overnight. Three million. Three. Overnight. One store became nine stores. Okay? So, what were the three major decisions that she needed to make? Let's find out. like this cool, creamy concoction. In the United States alone, people consume over 1.6 billion gallons of frozen goodies a year. That's close to 5.8 gallons per person. At Amy's Ice Creams in Austin, Texas, they're more than willing to help you get your share. Each year, Amy's nine stores sell close to $3.5 million worth of super premium flavors such as Belgian chocolate, dark chocolate, sweet cream, and of course, the ever popular Mexican vanilla with strawberries crushed in. Stop by one of her stores and you'll understand why people come back again and again. Everything is designed to provide a memorable and fun experience. It's Ice Cream Theater, directed by Amy Miller, Chief Executive Officer. 
When people come to Amy's, I want them to leave lighthearted. I want them to have a memorable experience. Uh, it may not even, they may not be aware that it really even involves us or the ice cream. It may be between, you know, their family or, you know, a first date or, uh, or somebody, you know, who just met somebody there perhaps or even had a human moment with one of our employees. And I know two schools is too much for you. And we will start talking for I just want them to feel that humanity that's kind of lost as our as we have less and less contact with people um, and less and less community. I want them to have a good sense of community, a sense of warmth and happiness and a memorable experience. Amy entered the ice cream business as a pre-med student at Tufts University. Working for Steve's Ice Cream in the 1980s, she helped to open stores in Manhattan and Miami, Florida. But as she approached graduation, she faced a big choice, step stone or ice cream scoop. I chose to enter the ice cream business because when I was in college, I was undergraduate um, biology and psychology and pre-med and did research in a, in a medical lab and, and at the Harvard Primate Center. And I also, for money, made, went worked at an ice cream shop, Steve's Ice Cream. And it was so sort of dull and dry in the, in, the, uh, in the medical lab. And when I went to the ice cream shop, it was just, it was so much fun. I wanted to work Saturday nights because all my friends were there and I loved my customers and all that was almost better than going out. And so it really drew me in <laughs> because it was so much fun. And ice cream itself is a panacea in life. People, if they're in a bad mood, they come into an ice cream shop to cheer them up. Um, they come in with family to celebrate something. They come in with a first date. To be a part of that is, you know, it, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. As Amy and a partner from Steve's prepared to open her first store, they quickly had to make many decisions that would affect the future of the business. When we first started, we had to decide where to locate, and that was a very difficult decision. And we were very flexible, and we just wanted to be in the town we wanted to live in. So we looked at England, and we landed on Austin, and it really was perfect, and that decision was made based on the climate, um, the population being young, and you know, that supporting a kind of eclectic ice cream shop. Um, and people haven't been exposed to the product before. You don't want to. You don't want to be the first one to educate a market that's very expensive. So we landed on Austin. That was a tough decision. Um, then our the next decision was how to raise money to start the business. How much money to raise? Uh, where to locate within? Once we just chose the market, where to locate within that market? Um, and how to structure our initial offering. So it, it, those are difficult decisions to make in, in starting a business. Amy's Ice Creams is a privately held corporation with 22 family members and friends as shareholders. We are very fortunate with Amy's to, because we have 22 investors, to have a real wealth of, of talent. We have uh, just very experienced people um, to choose from. Under the corporate form of ownership, the company enjoys several advantages. First, the company has limited liability. The liability of Amy and her investors is limited to their personal investments in the corporation. If the business should fail, each investor only stands to lose the money they've invested, nothing more. Another advantage is continuity. Since every corporation has a legal life separate from its founders and owners, it can, at least theoretically, go on indefinitely. Shares can be sold or passed on from generation to generation. Finally, corporations have advantages in raising money. For example, Amy's Ice Creams could sell more stock to expand the number of investors and the amount of available funds. The funds could be used to buy more equipment or open more stores. Lenders are also more willing to grant loans to corporations because of their legal status and continuity. There are a few disadvantages to corporate ownership, however. For example, profits are taxed twice. The corporation must pay taxes on its income, and each investor must also pay taxes on their individual shares of the profit. One way around this issue is to form a subchapter S corporation. 
Under this form, companies like Amy's Ice Cream pass their net income on to shareholders who bear the responsibility for taxes. Dividends are then paid to investors to help cover their tax liabilities. Compared to forming a sole proprietorship or partnership, forming a corporation is relatively expensive. And corporations can make it unattractive for others to take them over by adopting financial policies, such as paying large dividends to stockholders if the company is bought out, that would greatly diminish its value upon such action. As Amy and her team have grown the business, they've developed innovative ways to attract both customers and new employees, store theme nights, guerrilla marketing promotions for charity, and paperback job applications are just a few of the approaches used at Amy's. A lot of the eclectic things in the company, like our theme night, got started because an employee came up with the idea. And I think my skill is allowing the creative employees to be a little bit freer than most companies and put to work their ideas to make the company magical. And that's really what happened with the theme nights. People got together and decided that they were going to have a party up on the shift and all dress up like something interesting so that they would enjoy their shifts more. And it really involved the customers, and the customers had a wonderful time, and so they really then got very competitive with one another as to, as to who could do the best job, and, and they've continued for 15 years. I felt for a long time that, that an ad in a newspaper is not going to bring someone into an ice cream store. It may bring you know, a few people, but for me personally, it doesn't speak to me and say, run into the ice cream store, get some ice cream. But tasting the product, seeing the people, getting a feel for the culture of the company really does. So what we do rather than advertising is take that same budget and invest it in doing charitable events. And that really works, I think, better than direct advertising. It's kind of a symbiotic relationship with your community rather than um, you know just advertising and paying the you know the fees in the air, in the newspaper. For an application at Amy's, uh, people you may expect your your form, but but we don't give that to people. We give them a blank white paper bag, and we ask them to be as creative as possible with it. And the idea. Then again, um, because we ran out of applications and, and an employee gave a bag to someone who just said, write down your information. And the applicant came back with something really creative that caught our eye. And, and it's rather dull going through a lot of applications, so this really made it fun for us. It also showed that the employee really wanted to work at Amy's because lots of people went around to a bunch of different businesses and turned their applications in. And this tells us that they really want to work here. And we've gotten incredible pieces of art on those white paper bags. We've gotten um, helium balloons floated in where the bag gets the basket, and it's filled with things like their Girl Scout awards and pictures of all their friends, and just things that tell you who they are a lot more than an application would. And so we've kept that up. And of course, the interview is what really gets somebody a job because their people skills and their ability to identify with our mission that, that we hire on. But you'll definitely get more attention if you do something spectacular. Amy's goal of helping people create happy ice cream memories is met every day. You feel it when you walk in her stores. You taste it in each flavor. And you see it on the faces of employees and customers. She wouldn't have it any other way. All right, decision number one. Location. Location was where? And what do you never want to do? Yeah, you never want to have to educate a market about your product, right? Which is kind of like saying you don't want to sell ice cream in uh, in Alaska, right? You want to have a market that there's going to be a demand and a knowledge for your product. Number two? Funding. Funding. Where did the money come from? 22 family member and friend investors. Agree? 22 family member and friend investors. And number three? Structure. What is the legal structure of Amy's Ice Cream of Austin, Texas? What kind of corp? Good, I heard it. S corp, absolutely. It is an S corporation. That is their legal structure. And so, what does that mean? What does Amy's Ice Cream do if it's an S corporation? It, uh, it, it takes all the remaining. 
Good. It takes all of its net income and it distributes them to? The shareholders. And then the shareholders do what? Amen.